Um, so this talk, I'm going to talk about how we are going to re remove the name of membrane limitation by trying to store inodes and other information to this. Um, I've already said about it. Um, I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon uh, right now doing internship in Congress. So uh, this is my contact. You see that too. Um, my thesis or my research is mainly about how to do scalable metadata service. Um, you all know big data, and I know you guys definitely will work with big data. So according to the uh, IBM report, we are basically generating 2.5 quillion bytes of data every day. And like this long digital sky survey is generating 200 device per night. Uh, based on this report from Facebook, so uh, in Q January this year, they already have 240 billion of photos stored uh, for the whole Facebook website. And users are constantly actively um, uploading 250 million of photos uh, per day. And for like a cloud storage provider, Amazon reported that they have truly two trillion objects stored. And uh, their peak uh, performance or like their peak request can be 1.1 million operations per second. So I'm showing you all these numbers to maybe try to convince you that we need a really scalable storage system. Um, by scalable, I mean you want the metadata service to be fast enough so you can get as many requests as possible. And also you want to store as much data as you want, so that's the scalable storage. And, to, and when you store the data, you want to make sure you have really high throughput. So what's, what the system should be look like? This kind of looks like similar to the HDFS, and is also adopted by so many file systems. So what we have here is we have the clients here um, representing like all the users. And for the file systems, it's usually divided into two rows. One is the metadata servers, which is mainly responsible for all metadata related operations and information. And the other one is the data storage servers, uh, which we show here. And usually for a file system, and most in file systems in production, uh, there, if there are not so many metadata servers here, usually there's one. And there are lots of lots of data servers. So we believe that, or most of the file systems believe that, uh, it's easier to just add in more data servers. Uh, but when you assume that most of the work should be done by these data servers for both transferring more files or just store them there, and the work for the metadata server should be not much. So usually like the assumption for the Google file system or HDFS is that the files are usually really large. So in order to transfer like 64 megabytes of data, you only need to talk to the name node once. So that makes sure that the load on name node is really low. But in reality, we actually find there are lots of small files. So we don't think that um, the work on the metadata servers are quite small. So there is a requirement to actually make this metadata server scalable. So try to do make it scalable, we are trying to do two things. One is try to make sure the system can use multiple servers, which is introduced by the Federation. And also try to make sure that metadata servers can store as many files as they can, uh, or they want. So this is what I'm going to talk about later. So I think you guys are all familiar with federated HDFS. I'm just going to cover it really, really fast because it's not the focus of the talk. So in the federated HDFS, what you have is multiple name nodes, and each of them will see its own namespace as shown here. Sorry, the I think all the characters are messed up. Um, I don't know what will happen to the graphs. I hope they don't have the same problem. So basically, what you see up here are the name nodes. So each of them is seeing their own namespace. So they don't need to talk to each other. And it's really up to the clients about how to utilize all these name nodes. Um, but all the data nodes can talk to all the name, uh, name nodes. 
So I was told that most clients or users are kind of happy with this design. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we can talk about it later. I mean, after the talk, if you are more interested. But this is just trying to show you that um, Asia has kind of multiple labels for better throughput. So if you want better throughput, you probably want to use better Asia fast right now. And what is for users who don't need that much throughput for method operations? But you need to store more files than what a single name node can help right now. So currently, for a single name node, all the metadata needs to be in memory. So this has some really good benefits. For example, it makes the whole design really simple. So you always assume everything in memory. And also, you can achieve really low latency for your operations with really high throughput. Um, and right now, I think the running clusters can have up to 3,000 uh, data servers, so it's working perfectly right now. And uh, since Hadoop Foxum is so popular and stable, so it really allows the user to store lots of data. So uh, in many clusters, there are lots of really cool data, which is not accessed that much, and they're taking space. Not just the space in the storage node, but also the space uh, in the memory, in the name node. Uh, we have a cluster in CMU, and you can see our own name node is using about 20 gigabytes of memory, ready right? just maintaining this namespace. But users usually don't use all, all the files in the system. There are lots of really tall files in the system. So for certain clusters, it's possible that um, the growth of your data size actually exceeds your growth for the throughput, or you don't need that, much, that really high throughput from your metadata service. What you need is just the ability to store as much files as you can in the system. You don't really need to make sure everything is in memory. So our goal for this project is to remove the space limits from um, AML, and hopefully to provide you the similar performance. Um, so if you look at what's actually stored in AML right now, uh, for the metadata, there are mainly two or three categories. The first one is the namespace. So the namespace is that your tree tree structure you have, like uh, root and maybe your home directory, your user directory, time directory. And this is currently stored as a tree linked by iNodes. And uh, this is more of the HDFS API uh, side effect. So Whenever the API is based on the full path, so basically whenever you want to visit the file or a directory, you have to visit it from the root, and then you basically traverse your directory, uh, your path through there. And the second really huge amount of data stored in namespace right now is the block map. So it has a block ID to its location mapping, and this is this is this is a problem and will be a problem in the system and this will handle separately. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, the main problem is that you can have lots of blocks and these blocks can need to be processed or they need to be sent targets and all those stuff. But this will be another uh, project going on um, trying to solve this one. So there are other information like data node status, like was there uh, are they alive or healthy anymore, or uh, they need to send their block reports, and also leases. So the last two part of the information uh, about data node status and leases are not that much. Uh, they can just be stored in memory as long as they want. And the main part of the memory is taken up by the inodes and block reports, um, blocks. So blocks is handled separately, and this talk I'm focusing on how to remove this namespace limit. Um, the problem is to remove this name trace limit and keep, try to keep your performance similar. And how are you going to do this? So essentially, once you're going to keep a cache version of your name trace. So basically, you just keep a portion of your name trace in memory. Uh, we're going to store the whole name space in this using block structure merge tray. Right now, we're using LevelDB as our library to do that. And by doing this, uh, you don't need checkpoints anymore, and you, don't, you won't have any locks anymore. So this also gives us the benefit of really fast uh, startup. So whenever the system starts, uh, it can just start immediately without reading anything in. Though this will result in kind of slow initial operations, but, uh, but when, uh, without, 
But I think this kind of this is still beneficial compared to what you need to do today. Uh, you really need to read your FS image and apply all your ideas. So this is a benefit we get, though we don't show that in the numbers later. Um, we are not expecting the customer to reduce their memory size or their heat size because we believe you can still benefit from using a kind of bigger memory than your or kind of bigger heat size than your working cell, which is usually pro uh, probably really small. Uh, there are some benefits of doing that as I listed here. Basically, like when you transfer from like one working set to the other one, because we don't know like which work, which part of the namespace we'll be working on later. So we kind of hope like the other portion will be also in memory. So if you have enough memory, that's two benefits for this system. Uh, what do we look like? This is what the current name node looks like. Uh, you have inode in the memory, and constantly you're writing add logs to this to make sure the system is your own. And this is the newer one, or the one with level to be what will we look like. So you have a smaller uh, inode or namespace in your memory. Uh, whenever it's, there's any like create or maker, what you have is this all these changes will be right to the disk through level to be. And you see like there's a buffer for level to be and the level to be itself has a wall that's more of like implementation details. But the idea here is that um, all our changes to the inodes will be written to this, so that you don't need add logs or a bad submission. Um, every other parts are the same. Uh, level to be here is basically just a library for using to other source. Uh, in order to write our inodes to this, what we have is a key and all the value for this inodes. And the key here will be the inodes of the parent directory plus the, no, uh, the name of the file or directory. So that's what this be like. Oh, and if there's a miss from when I okay when I go to read the file or directory and there's a miss and we don't find it in cache, we just read it from level D. Uh, that's the structure. Um, I guess some of you will wonder why how different is this from the local file system or most of the traditional file systems. Um, or I don't see any questions on anyone's face, then I can skip it because I I think they are really similar. Um, uh, VFS layers have actually inode cache and the, the entry cache, which is a directory entry cache. So what we do here is we are just trying to have a cache which is which looks more like a namespace. So we can we hope that we can benefit from that. And also for local file system, they have a different workload than what we have for the Hadoop file system. Um, for the local file system, it only um, probably mostly uh, usually deal with just one machine and one user. Um, so it doesn't have the workflows uh, patterns as Hadoop, where usually you have really, really hot area, like all your Hadoop jobs will run against a few directories. That's what we actually expect from your workload. And we probably are able to keep a lot more inodes in the memory, so we hope that we can use, we can take advantage of that too. And also for the Hadoop, we need to support that really large traffic to the Hadoop cluster. And for the Hadoop cluster, or the name node itself, it doesn't need to store any data, so it only cares about metadata. data. That's really different. Um, does anyone know LevelDB here, or should I explain more? No. Okay, so what's LevelDB? LevelDB is this fast key, or what they claim is really fast. Uh, key value storage library written by two guys from Google, really famous Google guys. And um, this is a, it, they support really simple operations like put the identity. Um, they allow you to have single process uh, accessing the database or the key value store, but they support multiple threads. So, now, um, I think this satisfies our requirement because name node only use one thread, uh, one press, so that there can be multiple threads. And for LevelDB back calls, like the rights are asynchronous. Uh, we try to make sure all our rights are synchronous instead of asynchronous, so we are doing batching there to take advantage of that. Um, they, they do support batch updates, that's how we can advertise our calls, but when we are doing synchronous updates, um, and they have their data automatically compact with Snappy. That's, I think, also some 
compression algorithm out there. Uh, everything is open source. Uh, you can interrupt me if you have any question or this is like, let me know if anything I can, I should skip. Um, so, this is another part, part in our system. So, in our system, let me, if I, um, Reminder again, what's there is we have a high node namespace cache. Um, and then we try to write all our that updates to level DB, through level DB to this. So the question is how are we going to do our cache replace, replacement policy? Um, the idea is kind of simple, we just do RRU. But do we do RRU based on single entries? Right now we don't. And we think there should be some benefit of doing this. Um, so right now our strategy is we only replace directories, all of them in, all the entries in the directory in or out. So that whenever we do, um, so our hope is that um, whenever you do a reader, which is kind of common in HTTPS, you can usually get all of these data in memory, or you do a scan from the key value store, which is probably one disk C to fulfill your requirement. Uh, whenever you do a create, because create also means you need to check some file, whether the some file exists right now. So if you have all your inodes in one directory in the memory, then you can just do this check in memory instead of another read from the disk. So that's why we make this decision. So we're trying to reduce the number of reads we need from this as much as possible. And we do have a separate thread to do our cache replacement so that we can re remove this eviction from our critical path, where we are still holding a lot. We're trying to remove that. Um, that's about our cache replacement policy. Um, any question on this? Or should I explain more? No? Or good? Or not good? Um, continue. Um, so benchmark. Um, Could we implemented protocol on this? Uh, not protocol. Prototype on this, sorry. Um, these are the benchmarks we want to run. Um, the, the highlight one is which we've been running. Um, this LNS3 benchmark comes with a Hadoop distribution. Uh, what's there is there is no RPC cost. What it does is it starts a process with like a name node. And then uh, all the client threads basically just issue requests by calling the name node method directly. So, so there's no RPC cost. We're just trying to measure like how much or how we're adding to name node compared to original one. And I think um, using the RPC probably can will make this difference smaller. That's why we start with the uh, super benchmark. And for the uh, super benchmark, um, all the operations are generated based on their reference order. So this is what you see is like a throttle goes from the top of the main phase and the second layer, third layer, fourth layer. That's what it's doing. Uh, so each thread is working on different part of the namespace, so they never overlap. Uh, this is uh, what it does. Uh, I'm open to like suggestions about what are other interesting workloads and which can more represent your workloads. That would be really interesting to see. And for the tests, there are two different kinds of tests. Uh, the first one is we are trying to compare the performance when every all the validated can fit in memory, basically saying our cache has all the information. We don't need to go to disk at all for reading. Um, hopefully the goal is to show that we don't have much performance degradation because we can always read from our memory. The second part is um, where our working set really doesn't fit in memory. So we can still have lots of, lots of uh, namespace in the, whole, in, the, uh, in the whole system, but we don't need to read all of them. We just want to show that um, Whenever we the older working set we are uh, we are touching doesn't fit in memory, or it can change over time. So we want to study different uh, replacement policy. Right now we only have one, but we want to study like more of them. And we we do need to get like more traces or more of the stats from like real clusters so that we can make this part more interesting or more realistic. Um, I would love to get traces from you guys over this program in our cluster to get stats. And this shows you the experiment setup for uh, our benchmarking. So basically all the hardware is from this pro project, um, funded probably by NSF. And this is from this Susigna nodes. So they have really powerful um, nodes. The CPUs are this AMD 
uh, CPU, which has 16 cores. Uh, the maximum uh, processing speed is 2.1 gigahertz. And in this experiment, all the, all the numbers I'm going to show you, I'm using SSDs, not disks right now. So I try to make sure um, I.O. is not a bottleneck yet. Because if I.O. is, is a bottleneck, you probably don't see that much difference either. So that's why I'm doing this on SSDs right now. Um, we are going to use this later to show the differences. And the heap size is set to 1 gigabyte. I uh, do think this is kind of enough to show the differences, though real clusters probably will run with bigger heap size, but that just makes our experiments run longer. Um, we, are see, we are using this in the super benchmark I just described it. Um, for the level DB uh, implementation, uh, level DB name node implementation, I'm setting this actually placement policy with a threat of like 90%. So there, there's a monitor separate thread which tries to evict its caches once uh, everything is 90% full. That's what it's doing. So this graph shows you the both of the systems are trying to create and close files, and there are 2.4 million of files. And all these files are empty files. There's no blocks involved in all those systems. And everything can fit in the cache or the heat size. Um, so the, once the file is uh, created and closed, it's never accessed again. But its parents probably will because we're using the, the namespace like level by level. And the accesses here show you the different number of threads and why that's true. Good. So one thing we can see, which is kind of interesting, is both these systems kind of peak at different number of threads. Um, I'm not really sure why. I kind of say like if there are two threads. We don't get enough batch effects, and I was the bottleneck at that time. Um, with four or eight threads, like the IO probably isn't the bottleneck anymore, but we can still get a little bit of benefit for using more threads here. And for our journey now, uh, the performance is about like 7,000 operations per second. Uh, for the newer one, uh, we get the best one we can get is when we have 16 threads, we can get about 6,000 operations per second. Um, we do see degradation, mainly causing by the cache replacement policy, because when we need to replace things out or when we try to read things, we don't know whether others are changing that, so we have to lock it. That's where I think some of the overhead comes from. Um, so we do see 13.5% overhead for just do creation. And this one shows you like when we're trying to create more files, uh, if we create 9.6 million of files, which it's actually bigger than the heat size, what will happen. Uh, the green, sorry, the blue line shows the name now. So um, this doesn't show the full one. So initially the name now is, uh, has a throughput as like 6.5 thousand operations per second. Uh, if the heat size is big enough, everything is so good. But once the heat size is, when you don't have enough memory and the garbage collection starts to kick in, where you see the performance actually starts to drop like from 4,000 operation, and then they try to actually drop to zero. Uh, this is what happens, and I think that's what you expect it to. Uh, it doesn't really matter for the name that was level D, because it's just constantly doing the swap, or the, sorry, the cache replacement. So it doesn't matter so much. Uh, the performance is about the same. Um, the, this one shows you if you are just going to get file, to get file info which is the same as the status of the file. So both systems have 2.4 million of files stored in the system. And we are going to read the first 600k, uh, first 600,000 uh, files, just like several times. And then basically you see each thread will work on different portion of, of the file, uh, of the namespace. And for the original name now, which is the blue line here, what you show is uh, when there are only two thirds, the performance is really good. Uh, usually it achieves like 80,000 operations per second. Um, I'm not entirely sure about why it actually jumps when there are more threads. Maybe there are kind of contention or like just context switch going on, um, which probably isn't true either. I, I don't know, I need to profile it. Uh, that's what I see. Uh, for a level there are two different cases. One is if all the, the files we're going to read can actually fit in memory which is the uh, red line here, uh, we see the performance isn't that much worse. Though with two threads, there are some degradation because initially the threads have to read all the metadata from the, uh, from the SSCs. 
uh, they're supporting for doing that. But once there are enough threats, it doesn't matter so much. But if the low DB cannot have its whole working set in memory, we do see performance degradation like from 10 to 20 percent, sometimes even more. Um, but I think this is still performing pretty good because we have kind of really good uh, cash ratio here. Uh, that, can, that basically concludes all my benchmarks I'm going to show you today. These are the things I'm going to run, and I'd love to have feedback from you about like, what you think are more interesting. Uh, other things will be like the load generator, which actually uses the real name node with all the RPC calls and everything. And we're going to run it with this YCSP plus plus framework, where we can have multiple clients and have more uh, monitoring data. And we're trying to build some real uh, load generator based on the real cluster traces, um, or to trying to gather traces or from real places. Uh, we may run the traditional two benchmarks, but we don't see, we don't expect to see any differences because it's mainly dominated by the data nodes, not the metadata operations. Um, for summary, so data node already has high availability, and the next problem is just trying to move this base implementation from uh, auto namespace, where we're working. That's what we are doing right now. Um, so right now, the level DB or the log structure merge seems working well. Uh, we are going to do more experiments on the real disk to see what's their compaction and all other or how it like, affects us. Um, there are other like, log structure merge implementations. We're not sure where we should do them right now. Uh, we'll th think about it after like, the level DB um, experiment. Um, currently, all the code is built on top of point twenty three point one. Um, okay, uh, because I know the quality is okay. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. I mean, like not so great as production uh, level. I think it's workable, and uh, hopefully, we can get it more better with like help from experts in Cloudworks. Uh, we will see how all these things work uh, with more experiments coming on, uh, coming up. Um, uh, that's actually my last slide for the talk. And here's my contact. And I'd like to get traces from you guys if possible. And if not, uh, we have some programs we can run on the audio logs uh, to gather like the stats about different um, uh, different operations, metal operations. Um, yeah, that's basically what we're going to do. And if you have any questions or like, anything, you can contact me. And now we have. So we have a few minutes. Do we have any questions for you? Uh, can you go back to the your hardware flight? Yeah. Uh, have you tried without the SSD the same thing and compare that again with this with the SSD? So have you tried it with without SSD? So. Here, um, I've tried before. I put the cache replace policy in, and I realized like for some of them, level DB can be a bottleneck because um, we are constantly doing syncing and everything. Um, so I want to separate them right now. That's why I'm doing this with SSD. I'm going to do it with this. Does it answer your question? Um, two, two related questions. On the, um, the, the tree structure versus the block map, do you have a sense of how much memory? Is it 50 50, would you say? Is it 40? Is it like 25? Like, how does that split up? So, is that you're saying that's 50 to 50? Um, roughly, roughly. Roughly, 50 to 50. But I am guessing that depend, also depends on our file size, right? If you have just smaller files, it's probably more like rhinos, but if your files are large, you, don't, you have more blocks than your files, then it's probably ours. Yeah. And on the block map, do you have any ideas of what you do there? Sorry, for... On the block map, what would you do there? So, um, for block map, so this whole thing, Sanjay is really interesting, and um, I think they're having some ideas about how to do that. One thing is try to have kind of hierarchy in the block maps, instead of just like a whole flat block IDs, you may have like kind of meta blocks or some other ideas to do that. Saying like, I can handle um, 
So right now, if you think of it as a kind of, okay, this is a total flat space, right? Everyone right. just has the same thing, or you see the same thing. The other thing you can do is you partition the space. So like, one person is responsible for a block from 0 to 100, 100 or sell that. The other one is responsible for another 200, to like 100, or something like that. So you try to group things together to be processed by another processing unit instead of the name list or the name node. That's uh, also a question. And I think the reason why this is different from the namespace is the namespace itself is a tree structure. So when you do method operations, you need to follow your 